so excited to be with you guys today, uh, especially because this is the first official presentation that I've done all about the guides and the tools that are in my book, which was published uh, in October of last year, and it's doing really well. I just want you guys to kind of see it uh, from here. It is a really thick book, which has been intimidating for some people. But I want you to know that as a parent, as a, as a person who takes care of young people, this is a guide that will last throughout a child's development. It's all in infographic style with fun graphics. I put as minimal text as I could on every page so that you uh, can enjoy the reading experience and there's an elementary, middle, and high school chapter. So as your children grow and develop, or if you have kids of different ages, you can go straight to the chapter that you need. Then there is a uh, chapter six, which is about 100 pages long. It's got tools and tips in it. What I'm going to be doing with you guys today is sharing with you prevention tools that you can use throughout your child's development. And then at the end, I'm gonna walk you through how to do a family code building activity at home. So I actually just had a parent yesterday email me with a few more questions and instruction about, about the um, activity. And she reported this morning that she did it last night with their kids and that it went really well and was quite successful. So I'm excited to share that with you today. So before I continue, I want to um, uh, share my gratitude and deep appreciation for, this is going to make me cry, for the Hope and Healing Center and Institute, specifically Gary Peterson and Paul Murphy, who funded a behavioral health fellowship, which gave me the time and the financial backing to do the research and write this book. So it was, uh, it took four years of research. I read over 500 journal articles, websites, and books um, in, in making sure that it was really very well referenced and science-based. And I, I um, just really want the Hope and Healing Center and Institute to know how much I appreciate you guys giving me that opportunity um, to be able to, to do this and to bring this to the community and especially to Gary and Paul for funding that and supporting research fellowships at the Hope and Healing Center. All right, let me share a little bit about, I think what really qualifies me to give you this topic today. And that is that I am a kiddo who engaged in lots of risky behavior, but I always was smart. I was a good person. By the time I was 11 years old, which is this geeky, awkward picture of me, I took my first drink of alcohol. And by the time I was 16, I had engaged in a lot of other risky behavior, including more illicit substance use. And by the time I was 18, which is this awesome big Texas hair picture of me at the end, that is the day that I actually graduated from rehab after surviving an overdose by the grace of God, was able to survive, go to treatment, get sober, get healthy, and I moved on to a sober living facility in a different state. But when the honeymoon period of my early recovery burst, that, that awesome pink cloud burst, I started feeling a lot of shame and guilt and confusion. I couldn't understand why this sweet little good kid who was always very smart made the decisions that I'd made and so I started studying everything I could get my hands on about substance use. And I don't know if you guys uh, remember, but between 1990 and 1999, that was considered the decade of the brain when all this functional MRI research was being published. And we started to learn how the brain grows and develops and how different behaviors affect it. So I started to learn about how um, a lot of different behaviors affect brain development. And then a very sweet parent a few years ago asked me, hey, when's your book gonna come out? And I thought, oh my gosh, what a daunting task to put all this there. And that's where the Hope and Healing Center came in and gave me the time and the, the support to actually do it. And so uh, here is the, my favorite brain study that you will see throughout the book is this particular one by Dr. J, uh, by Dr. Uh, Geed, who published these studies and discovered where in the brain 
uh, that brain is growing and developing as we age. And so we know that it's the prefrontal cortex or the frontal lobes that grow and develop as we um, grow. When we're about 12 years old, we've got about 10 to 15 percent of what will be our adult brain. By the time we're 16, about 45 percent. But when we're 20 years old, it's only 80 percent. Like we still have a whole fifth of brain development to go, which was amazing to me. And when I started to read more, I learned about the neuronal growth and how we grow neurons and then prune away neurons. This is a magnified picture of a little infant baby neuron. And as you can see, this neuron grows and develops all the way up to about age two when we grow these awesome dendrites that reach out to other neurons, making long strings of uh, these neuronal connections in our brain that equal the skills. So what we think, what we do, how we feel, creates these tracks in our brains, and these are malleable. Dendrites are literally the hardware of learning. Every time you learn something new, you grow a new dendrite that reaches out to another cell, all based upon the use it or lose it principle. When I started to realize how important the use it or lose it principle was, I started putting pieces together. Use it or lose it means if you use a track of neurons, it grows thicker and more dense, which means that you get better at that skill. If you don't use those neurons, literally they get pruned away to make room for the ones that you are using. And so this is what I uh, built the foundation of the Neuro Whereabouts Guide about, was you've got to know where your children are in the world, not only their whereabouts, but their neuro whereabouts. So in the first phase of brain development, which is from birth to through elementary and middle school, we grow lower level executive functioning skills. So I want you to take a look at these and think about how you do on these skills as well as how your kids do. Now, when we get to the second phase of brain development, which is from about 11, 12, all the way through the age of 25, we grow higher level executive functioning skills. These are the ones that we need to really grow up and become fully self-supporting and lead healthy, happy lives as an adult. And all of these skills are contingent upon the use it or lose it principle. So in the book, The Neuro Whereabouts Guide, the first chapter is all about healthy brain development. The second chapter is how high risk behavior affect it. Then there's an elementary, middle, and high school chapter. And throughout all of these chapters, they will teach you which high risk behavior out of 18 show up when and what you can do as a parent to prevent those things from your children from engaging in those. A lot of it has to do with brain-based parenting. So I did a lot of research on the difference between um, performance-based praise and task-based praise, intelligence-based praise, and brain-based praise. So here's some uh, just a little piece of that. When we tell our kids, good job, that is performance-based praise, and it is linked to an increase in anxiety and perfectionism. When you tell your kids, oh, you're so smart, that is intelligence-based praise, and that is actually linked to giving up too soon. When kids who get praise for um, being so smart and they finally do something that's hard for them, they may make up that they're not smart enough to tackle that. So what we wanna to try to do is use task oriented um, things like, I love your perseverance, keep trying, just put more effort into it, really great effort, nice attempt, and brain-based praise. Memorize executive functioning skills. You'll see them all over in the book. And in chapter six, there are actually scripts that help you figure out what to say if you wanna increase certain of these, uh, each one of these skills. So uh, this is the entire foundation really of the Neuro Whereabouts Guide is to know where your child's neurodevelopment is and what particular skills you can expect and how you can work on increasing those so that you have a kiddo who will make really good decisions when it comes to preventing high-risk behavior. Now, 
this page actually shows you a couple of the books sitting there and it gives our agenda for today. So I'm going to share with you guys some of the prevention tools that are in the guide. And the ones that are highlighted, these six here, those are going to be our anchors. These are the six things that I found in the prevention science literature that say actually do prevent kids from growing up and engaging in high risk behavior. I want you guys to know my sweet mom, uh, when my book came out, she read it all in one weekend. I was very impressed with her reading skills. But uh, it was really sad because she was so proud of me, but she also said that she wished that she had done a lot of these things, that it felt like a lot of the things she didn't know about that she could have done, uh, but she was really, really uh, proud and happy to see it. And so I really want you guys to hear that there are so many things to do in this book, but please do not use it uh, perfectionistically. Don't get down on yourself if you missed one of these with the kiddo. The idea is to meet you where you are and provide you with as many tools that fit for your family. Take what you want, leave the rest, definitely. So we're gonna start off with some information about family dinners. In the prevention science research, it's pretty amazing because they say that when family dinners decrease over time, high risk behavior can proportionately increase. But what the prevention science researchers found is that when we make an attempt to connect together as a family for meals consistently, we see high risk behavior reduce. And so I, I want you guys to see the chart that illustrates this. So this is a piece of the family dinner research that was conducted by the Center on Addiction many years ago, actually, but this um, data is still very relevant today. What they did is they took at a look at families that had zero to two family dinners per week, as opposed to families that ate together five to seven times per week. And they found out how much knowledge parents felt like they had about their children. In the families that ate together uh, zero to two times a week, the great deal to fair amount of information known was 60% up to 92%. They really uh, endorsed that they know very little actually about their kiddos. If you look at the little to no information known, then you see the numbers decrease. Little to no information, 40% of families who uh, met together five to seven times said that they felt like they had just little to no information, as opposed to the families, excuse me, the, um, the families who met zero to two times, as opposed to the families who met together five to seven times in the green. These families said that they felt like they had little to no information only 8% of the time. We want you to be in this tall green category, having five to seven dinners, per week as much as you can and having a really good sense that you have a great deal to fair amount of knowledge about your kids. And here's why this works so well. They interviewed kids who had a lot of family dinners with their um, uh, uh, parents. And they found that those kids talk more with their parents, even if the family dinners are short, they have more conversations per week. They talk about more variety of different topics. And those kids said things like, man, I don't want to engage in high risk behavior and show up stoned at my family meal and look across the table. But as opposed to the kids in the orange who actually met zero to two times per week, these are the kids whose families didn't uh, feel that they knew as much about them because they didn't. They were more able to keep secrets, keep more information hidden. They felt less comfortable talking with their parents and family members as a whole. Now, I know this seems like sometimes very difficult to achieve that many dinners per week. But if you take the word dinner out of it and substitute meal, 
This can be certain breakfast. This can be uh, lunch on the weekends. This can be maybe three family dinners in the evening, or you are um, you do a, a drive through when you're on your way to soccer, and at least you sit in the car together and eat and check in with each other before practice. Do your best to make it consistent. It doesn't have to be a whole long drawn out thing with all the family china. Just connecting over meals has a protective effect on kids as they grow older. Okay, the second out of the six tools that I'm gonna share with you guys today has to do with communication. And this dovetailed perfectly from the family dinner research because the families who meet together a lot talk together a lot. And so I don't know if you've ever heard of the dysfunctional family rules, don't talk, don't trust, don't deal, and don't feel. But what we know is that in families where there are problems or issues that have rules like this, problems become rigid and fixed. So what we wanna do is teach and practice the functional family rules. In our family, we talk, we trust each other, we feel our feelings and we deal with what's going on. If you share that rule with your family and let them know it's to your comfort level whenever you're ready, but we do expect you to talk to us and we want you to trust us with what's going on. We will validate your feelings, even if we disagree the reasons that you feel that way, but we will deal with the problems as they show up. If you work on creating that family rule, you will be able to have an atmosphere that is open and trusting with secure attachment formation. Now, here's a couple ways that you can also help kids communicate how they feel. There's something called emotional uh, literacy. And this is the idea that you can openly share about your feelings, that you have a good vocabulary of feeling words. As a therapist, when I meet a new client, that's one of the first things that I try to look for is how emotionally literate is that person? How much are they able to identify their feelings, where those feelings are in their body, and what words they use to describe them? Or do they say, oh, no, I think, instead of I feel. So for teenagers using a feeling wheel, this is the feeling wall that's actually in the book. You'll be able to order this as a poster in a few months. This is one great way to teach kids how to identify their feelings. And a second way uh, for the little ones is this tool called Kamochis. This is also actually a reference that's in my book. So I, uh, I know the um, president of this company out in California, um, and he is a really, really wonderful guy who has uh, headed up a company that's all about teaching kids emotional literacy from early childhood on up. Oh, my assistant's here, you guys. This is Vishnu. He'll be passing on the catwalk. <laughs> the benefits of doing presentations at home. Okay, the word kamochi, it means feeling in Japanese. And as you can see, these little guys are, uh, they have a feeling um, expression on one side and the actual um, text on the other. I have a bowl of kamochis in my office. And one of my clients who's about seven years old, actually just turned eight, the first thing he does when he comes in and he goes straight for my kamochi bowl, he dumps them all on my sofa and then he pulls out the words that fit him for the week. And we go through and he tells me when and how he felt these things. This allows him to not only have the words to express himself, but it gives him the kickoff point. This is something that you can have at your dinner table. The family table is have a bowl of kamochis. Kids, little kids can do a fun activity by pulling out the emotions that they have during the week and starting to talk about those. The younger you get kids to do these activities, the more emotional literacy, literacy they will have and the more uh, uh, um, reinforcement they will have for the functional family rule of talk, deal, feel, and trust. Okay. 
The next tool that you can use in your communication, this can be at the family dinner table or at any other time, is the high risk behavior checklist. So what I spent the past four years doing is researching each one of these high risk behaviors. I wanted to know how specifically do these behaviors affect the brain as it's growing and developing. And so you'll see that I put those in the appropriate places in the book so that you know as a parent when the behavior will pop up and when you should have your prevention conversation. And then of course in the book, there'll be one or two, maybe four pages that will describe to you what you need to tell your kids about at the appropriate age so that you can do it consistently over time. This checklist is also in chapter six to help you remember when you had the conversation. And so it's important to discuss these things before they start showing up. Just to give you an example, alcohol use, the average age is between about 10 and 14. The first use for alcohol today is younger than it was even a decade or two decades ago. The availability of it, the, um, the, the, the cultural significance of it. So it's important to remember that while your children are moving into middle school, it's important to start teaching them about alcohol use and setting up your particular rule for that. What the research literature found is that if kids don't know the rule before they're tempted, they are more likely to engage in the behavior. Let me say that again. If kids do not know the rule about the high risk behavior, before they're tempted to engage in it, they are more likely to engage in the behavior. A lot of parents will say to me, oh, but I wanna keep my kids innocent. I don't wanna to talk to them about suicide in elementary school. I don't want to discuss self-injury with them. I don't want them to know about these things. I totally validate that feeling and really understand it. But I wanna ask you this question. Would you rather your child learn about these behaviors from somebody at school? Would you rather them hear about it on a TV show? No, you want them to hear about it from you with a credible source that can teach you exactly what you teach them and then you set the rule. I really want you guys to hear me. I engaged in a lot of high risk behavior growing up my sweet mom really trusted me to take good care of myself because I was a good kid. But what she didn't um, have in mind was my neurodevelopment and all of the temptations that were out there in the world. She never mentioned to me that there was a rule about alcohol. I just knew in my family that they drank a lot. And I thought, oh, well, that must mean it's okay. So when somebody offered me alcohol at a party, I did not even imagine that it was against my family's code of ethics. Now, of course, years later, after my mom found out, she was thinking, okay, now what do I do? This is the idea of trying to be proactive. And even if you find out after the fact that your child is engaged in one of these behaviors, you can always go back and say, all right, now let's talk about what we should have talked about before. So before the behavior is prevalent, Every month or so, you want to bring up one or more of these behaviors as your children grow and develop. And you can do that at family dinner, and I'll give you a tool to do that. Also, you want to bring these behaviors up when it's needed. A lot of times what you'll find out at the family dinner table is that a friend of a friend of a friend did something, or you heard about somebody who engaged in one of these, or you saw it on the media. Those things can be brought in to discuss it, and then you can reiterate your family code. All right, here is the next tool that I think is really fun. I've had so many parents tell me that they really like this. This is called the Conversation Starter Calendar. And basically what I did is I compiled all of the high-risk behavior uh, calendar days that commemorate awareness and bring um, focus onto a behavior into the calendar. For instance, January is a great month to bring up technology issues. 
One of the most difficult things to talk to kids about are things like human trafficking, digital safety. And if you've got little ones who start to get on the internet or use tablets, it's really important that you talk about technology safety before they use a screen. And so at the dinner table, you can say, hey, did you know that today, January 11th, was National Human Trafficking Awareness Day? You may have kids who are like, what? What does that mean? And as a parent, you can say, well, let me tell you what that is. Human trafficking is when children, teens, and adults are kidnaps, kidnapped and usually sold or trafficked to another country and into slavery. Many abusive things sexually and physically are done with them. This is how human traffickers find people. They look for people who are vulnerable online and outside. So let's talk about how to keep you safe. And then you can go through the book under the technology section and go through the checklist, checklist and discuss how to keep kids safe online. This, making them feel more confident about the skills that they're building. Now, of course, doing it, this at the right time is critical. And so I took a look at all of these different topics and made sure to research what age is the best age to have these discussions. A lot of the times it's younger than you think. But remember, you want them to know the rule before they are engaged in a behavior or before they hear about it from someplace else. So there's all kinds of fun things in here. There's um, uh, National Friend Day, uh, National Smile Day. There is uh, Eating Disorders Awareness, Children of Alcoholics Week, uh, National uh, Missing Children's Week, National Say Something Nice Day, the Great American Smokeout. All of these are in here. When it turns the month, go into the calendar of conversation starters and just pick one or two that you want to bring up at a family meal. It gives you the opportunity to slip in a prevention conversation, but then make sure that you don't go on and on and on about it. At the end of the conversation, when you've defined it and talked about it, you can ask, hey, have you ever heard about this? Do you know anybody who has engaged in this behavior or that behavior? Well, let's just reiterate our family code. Our family code says this. Great way to bring that up at a dinner time or a meal time. Now, when you're trying to increase communication and build executive functioning skills, you'll find scripts. This is a good one that shows you what to say when you're trying to build abstract conceptual thought. Now, you may have a kiddo who has great abstract reasoning. All you have to do is sit back and reinforce and reward and share with them how much you like the way they think. If you have a kiddo that you want to improve their rational reasoning process, you may really benefit from going through reading these scripts and then you just incorporate them and make them into your own, own hip slick and cool language. In addition to the scripts, there are talks that will guide you when you're ready to have that talk. Here is one of the most difficult talks over here on the left the pornography talk or talks. I have put together based upon the research what you should say to kids at different ages so it's developmentally appropriate starting young at around age six, seven, eight, nine. Now you know each one of your children and what they might be prepared and ready for. So a, a very precocious adventurous child, you may start talking about some of these things as early as six or seven. Another child who's maybe a little bit more shy and cautious, you may wait until eight or nine. But what it'll explain to them is the difference between good pictures and bad pictures, what to do if they see a bad picture, not to have anxiety about it, but to feel confident about it that they now have a rule that guides their behavior and choices when they're exposed to it. It's not about scaring kids, it's about empowering kids and parents in a developmentally, neurodevelopmentally appropriate way. So what you'll see is that the language shifts a little bit when kids get into middle school and then definitely into high school.
Over here on the right, you see the media talk, which can help you teach kids how to analyze media for bias and keywords that they might see marketers use to try to glamorize or sell high risk behavior. We want to try to do the media talk when our kids get into around seventh grade or before if you see that they are being influenced by the media that they see. There is a talk for every high risk behavior in there. Some of the ones I've had parents really praise me for was the suicide talk, which is one of the hardest things to talk to kids about and the self injury talk. But I also have talks about refusal skills and the popularity talk, how to deal with those issues as your children grow over time. Here are a couple of the other tools that are included. One of my favorite ones is the medicine talk. In all the states that now have legalized marijuana, the marketers uh, tout it as a medicine. This will help you describe what a medicine is and what a medicine isn't to help your kids know what your family code and rule is about taking medicine. And there's also the activity pyramid, which can help you discover what kind of behavior kids should do uh, to balance their on and offline technology. This one is um, ah, the gambling talk. This one will share with your kids about what is gambling and what is okay in your family to use. We need to start having this talk when our kids move into about seventh, eighth grade and definitely into high school around March Madness time. What I have heard over my years of being a therapist is a lot of kids actually get into gambling around that time of the year. And this will actually give them, give you some questions to ask them. You can even play the odds game to talk about what accurate risk perception looks like. Just another example of one of the talks that's in the book. Okay, then I also have some tools that you can use when your kids hit certain milestones. So one of the biggest questions that I've been asked over the years is when should my child have a smartphone? And so what the research shows is that your child should have a smart enough prefrontal cortex before they actually own a smartphone. Each kid developmentally will be different, but waiting until the eighth grade, even though that sounds really tough and difficult, is pretty critical. Now, of course, kids can have like the flip phone or the non-smartphone before that for contact, but once they have worldwide access to the internet, they now will be inundated with lots of other high risk behavior. And this smartphone contract, I actually looked at probably 15 of the ones that are recommended and compiled the ones that I thought were really the most relevant and important to keep themselves safe from a lot of different risky behavior. And then of course the driving contract. Once your kiddo does get a license, which I know a lot of you are thinking, oh, when will they get a license? I really want them to drive. Kids are getting them later and later and later because they're more uh, sedentary and screen oriented and don't really care to drive as many places. But once they do, this contract will really cover the different high risk behavior, uh, including alcohol or writing with somebody that has alcohol. We wanna make sure that they know what are the good rules are for keeping themselves safe when driving. But one of the things that prevention science says we really need to do, if our kids engage in a high risk behavior is to treat the problems immediately. We wanna make sure that when our child has engaged in one of these high risk behaviors that we institute behavior modification. So I have a whole uh, presentation specifically about what behavior modification looks like and how to shape children's behavior and their choices. This is an example that's in the book of a BMOD contract. There's actually a blank contract as well. And you can also find blank contracts free on my website if you'd like, the neurowhereaboutsguide.com. But this gives you a little bit of an example of what one might look like. You definitely wanna keep it simple keep it positive and keep it consistent. One of the biggest mistakes that prevention science says parents make is giving their kids everything, 
so that once it comes time to shaping behavior, now you have to actually take away things and have them earn it. We got to make sure that our kids earn all of the privileges that they get, that if they get a cell phone or if they get peer privileges, if they get to have technology or own a car, that it's important they know what behaviors they need to do in order to earn those privileges. If they're just given those things, it can create a sense of entitlement, being very spoiled, and then that can work against them later when they're wondering why they have to earn some of the rewards in life. Behavior modification can help when and if kids engage in certain high-risk behavior. Now, here's something also that if we see kids engage in alcohol use, what we want to do is really move our prevention efforts to preventing further more intensified use. Now, this is where I want to pause and just talk really quick about what the research says about alcohol use under age. So many parents ask me, is it that bad? I mean, I drank in high school and I'm okay, or I did that in college quite a bit, and I think I turned out all right. Let me share with you, out of 100 people who drink alcohol, 16 will grow up to become an alcoholic. That number has been steady for decades in our country. It is important to understand that it's a rite of passage in many young people's eyes to go to parties, to drink, and to binge drink. We want to teach kids what healthier, normal drinking might look like. So in the book, I actually have a normal drinking formula that starts at the age of 21. You want to teach that to kids not to condone underage drinking, but so they know. I have a lot of kids who will go out there and break the family rule about no drinking, binge drink because they don't know any better, and have alcohol poisoning, or get into a drunk driving accident, either while riding or driving with other kids. The research says that the younger children start drinking, the more likely they will have a problem when they're older. Your scientific just justification for the rule of no alcohol use is that they have to protect their frontal lobe development. Alcohol can arrest it. And so if other kids say, man, other kids go out and drink, well, I hear you. But in our family, this is our code. We protect our frontal lobe and alcohol has the power to arrest your executive functioning skills. But I want you to be prepared because I trust you. When you go out there, I want you to be a good steward of our family code. But if for some reason you break the family code, of course, this will be your consequence. But I also want you to know what to do if you see it happening out in the world, especially alcohol poisoning. So in the book, I actually have a cutout card that you can actually literally cut out of the book and put it into your child's wallet or purse so that they will have this. I actually got this idea from some alcohol cards that I saw out in the world and a group of parents who used to pass this out over at St. Thomas High School. And one particular boy in, uh, who came up and told me the story about when he saw someone who he thought might have alcohol poisoning, he literally pulled the card out of his wallet and got help. Now, it's very sad to me because I've also talked to many kids who did not do that, who left the scene and kids were um, left unattended and uh, quite ill. So when your kids or if your kids engage in the behavior, you can use behavior modification contracts to let them know that there are consequences. You can also start the drug testing. So this is another thing that prevention science says actually works to prevent high risk behavior, but there's a lot of mixed reviews about it. So let me share with you that what I find in the literature, it is the number one refusal skill. And so you can see this drug test cup has a nice red bow on it because this is how I want you to use this. When your kiddos turn around 11, 12, you can, along with all their other birthday presents, say, hey, guess what? You have officially entered in the second phase of brain development. And now 
your brain is going to be a little bit more interested in risky behavior, but your frontal lobe is going to take a while to catch up. So I'm going to give you your number one refusal skill. Here's a cup. And you can say, I'm going to drug test you once, maybe twice, every year while you're in high school. Then when you go to that party, you can say, man, my mom drug tests me. I can't do it. Or my mom alcohol tests me. Ah, uh, no, no. It's interesting because what kids will say is that they love this. At first, they'll be like, what? You don't trust me? I can't believe this. Here's how I want you to answer that question. It has nothing to do with me loving you or believing you. But the trust issue, I trust the part of your frontal lobe that is grown and developed, but I don't trust the other part that's not yet. So I'm going to act as your frontal lobe until you grow one fully and successfully on your own. I'm just going to give you a refusal skill. Now, if you say this to your kiddo, it is important that you are consistent and follow through. I've coached a lot of parents to give their kids a drug test. And at first it felt really awkward, but once you do it a couple times, it'll be no big deal. And the earlier that you start, the more buy-in that you'll get. Now, if you are suspicious, go ahead and te drug test. And if your child ends up using a drug or alcohol, that's when you start drug testing with a behavior contract on a more frequent basis. But the earlier you start this, the less likely that will happen as your kiddo grows up. Okay, now we get to, let me just make sure, yep, there's the family code activity. We're almost uh, to the end here. I'm gonna give you guys plenty of time to answer questions, but here is the family code. This is the last thing that uh, I, I wanna share with you guys today, the tool that prevention science says literally prevents high risk behavior from happening. The younger that you start it, the greater effect that you have. So in the book, there is a family code activity and there's some information about when to do the family code. We recommend that you do it in uh, late elementary school around fifth, sixth, and definitely seventh grade way before they get to middle school is really the best way to do it so that you can repeat it often. But a family code is a, it's kind of like your family's mantra. It is a short values and ethics declaration of how you guys do things in your family. And so here's my favorite one. In our family, we treat others with kindness, compassion, and respect on and offline. We take care of our brain development. We don't engage in risky behavior. We never use drugs and only alcohol when we're 21 or over. So here's the activity. Get a poster board or a computer screen, markers, crayons, pencils, pens, be as creative as you like. Get some notebook paper and first have a family meeting. Talk about how everyone want, should participate, even the little ones. Brainstorm first about your family's values, things that really represent you as a family. It could be kindness, compassion, unity. There's some examples in the book that can help. Then make a list of risky behaviors that go against your family's values. And then narrow that down to the ones that you guys feel are the most important and write a few sentences that combine those core values and the risky behavior that you'd like to prevent together. Combine that text with a graphic or artwork. One of my favorite ones is a family drew a big family tree and each leaf represented a different value. And each person in the family was sitting under the tree. And then right below that, they had their family code. Proudly display your family code somewhere in your home and use that during your dinner discussions and discussions about risky behavior. So imagine you're sitting around the dinner table and today is um, National Vaping Awareness Day. And you say, hey, guess what? National Vaping Awareness Day. And one of your little ones in elementary school is like, huh, what? And your middle schoolers like, yeah, I saw so-and-so do that. It starts the conversation. Use the three magic words. 
that all parents should know, and it's not I love you, it's tell me more. When your kids say, yeah, I saw that at middle school, instead of go, oh my God, what's happening? No, 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 don't do that. Simply go, huh, tell me more. Tell me more. How did you learn that? What do you think about that? Elicit information from your kids, validate their feelings, praise them for sharing with you. If you hear them exhibiting one of those really good executive function skills, tell them, oh, I like how you're solving that problem. Or, I, I, man, that's pretty cool the way you're thinking about this. And then right at the end of that conversation, just simply say, well, it goes against our family code. And one of your kids may say, oh, yeah, that's right. We've got that behavior in our family code. We don't use drugs. Then in other times, when your kiddos are on their way outside, going out into the world, especially during things like sleepovers or events or get togethers, football games, all kinds of things like that. Say to your kid, hey, remember the code? What's our family code? Now the day that your child says, oh my God, mom, our family code is wah, 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 wah. <laughs> That's when I want you to say, I love your memory. Really proud of you for remembering that. Now, this is not a lecture. You don't go on and on and on. You just ask them to repeat the family code and say, I'm really proud of you for representing our family that way. That's our code. And then of course, when kids are in trouble or they break the family code, you can say, I understand your brain development is causing you to seek novelty. It's understandable why you broke the family code, but I do want you to know what the consequence for that is. You got two weeks of grounding and extra chores, buddy. Next time, tell me how you're gonna go out and represent our family a little bit better. This is a great way to create unity. And that's what the research says on this particular tool is that kids like to know what the rule is before they go out into the world. They literally wanna know what the rule is, what you think about high risk behavior. They may have a different opinion or idea, but they really wanna know what we think and what our rule is. And it also creates unity. Kids can go out into the world and say, uh-uh, I don't do that. My family doesn't do that. My mom would kill me if I did that. And when you look at the prevention literature, the number one reason why kids say no to risky behavior is exactly that. Uh-uh, my mom would kill me if I did that. And then eventually as they grow into a teen and to a college student and go out into the world, it becomes their own internalized individual family code values and beliefs that they can pass along to their family. All right, you guys, those are our prevention tools and your family code activity. I hope you create your family code. Remember, it's never too late. You can even create it when your kids are in college. You may do it on a computer rather than with crayons, but you can say, you know what? I just learned this new fun tool and I wanted to do it even though you're 25 years old. You can also buy the book for those 25 year olds if they're about to have kids of their own. But I wanted to make an announcement today that I'm really excited about. I have just joined up with the John Fontaine Jr. Charity to create an online prevention program for schools based upon everything that's in the book. And of course it has brain in the title. <laughs> it's called Brain Abouts and it will enable and empower kids to make positive choices in their life. So we are actually online already beta testing the product and we will be ready to go by the beginning of the school year uh, for schools in the community. So if you want this program at your school or if you uh, want me to come speak for your school uh, faculty or parents or students, please feel free to contact me. Here's my information. And of course, the Neuro Whereabouts Guide can be found on Amazon 